Conoce las historias de las personas que son parte del cambio para proteger nuestro planeta. Esto es Sustentablemente. Conversaciones que inspiran. Un podcast original de Radio Pauta con Carolina Escobar. Hello, hello. So, um, here I have a great different invitation with a wonderful guest. Uh, Jib Ellison founder and CEO of uh, Blue Sky, um, as you all may know, one of the first consulting firms to um, help companies pursue their um, their love for uh, nature, their uh, material business businesses. So um, he was a pioneer among those. And then before that, he was conducting expeditions around several countries. And he has taken some time from his busy agenda to spend and chat with us today with the Duella podcast. So, Jib, thank you so much. And we're saying hello from today. I'm in California, Northern California. California. Wonderful, Jib. Thank you so much for your time again. And um You know what, since uh, we're going to have this conversation about 10, 15 minutes, I would like to invite you to let's pretend, because I've always think about this, uh, thought about this, is let's pretend we're um, by a lake in the south, and we could do south of Chile since I'm here. Yeah. And um, actually, I've got my mate with me, so we could be drinking mate. Don't Oh! <laughs> If this wasn't rehearsed or anything. No. No, no, no. I uh cool. No, I uh I've spent a lot of time in Chile. Wonderful. Chile. Well, I'd love to start. Um for those that maybe don't know your whole um story and and actually your storyline. How did you start? How did you foresee um years ago before Anybody was um, actually thinking or mainly talking about sustainability and even less in the business area. So how did it all start? Yeah, it's it is an unusual story. I was, as you said, I was a river guide for a long, long time, kayaking and rafting and did a lot of first uh, descents all over the world, including Chile in the 80s, uh, a long time ago. And um I went to college along the way and studied philosophy and particularly in 1985 studied uh, nuclear deterrence theory. And uh, that's basically the uh, the the logic behind um, having more bombs than your enemy. And if I have a bigger bomb than you have, then you won't bomb me first because I'm going to destroy you. But the problem is, of course, if I have more bombs than you do, there is a risk that I will destroy you first. So then that means you have to get a bigger bomb. So in the mid 80s, the, the Soviet Union, and the United States were involved in a, in a Cold War and an arms race. I took a class. I was 23 years old. And it so shocked me that in really literally a walk home from one of my classes, I was like, I have to do something. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any money. I didn't really have any skills. I knew how to do one thing. So I ended up doing river trips with the Soviet Union. I did uh, youth exchange programs and they were uh, called citizen diplomacy initiatives. So the idea was. If the politicians can't get along, maybe regular people just, you know, who are trying to get make, you know, make do with the best they've got uh, in life. And it was true. You know, basically regular people are regular people um, in all these countries. I'm quite convinced, having spent a lot of time. So so it was a very interesting time. So I got to be part of the whole transformation of the Soviet Union to Russia, the the lessening of the Cold War at the time, things have changed. Probably time to do another round of, of these exchanges. Um, but I learned that I really like to be involved in big transformative, play a small part of big transformative change. Fast forward, I became a management consultant, got married, had kids, you know, had to get a real job. 
became a management consultant. Um, and then I, about 20 years ago, I went to a lecture from uh, a Swedish oncologist and he was talking about sustaining life on planet earth. And there was four principles. And I watched this presentation and I realized like, this is the big idea because, you know, in a management consultant, you help companies achieve something that they can't achieve on their own. Usually it's how to make more money uh, in traditional sense. So you work both with the, the technical side of businesses, the kind of the engineering side, how businesses are organized, how that all works. And then there's all these, like I think of it like the tribal side, the people side of businesses. And you have to coordinate all these things to be able to get people to work together to you know, pursue a new market, take out costs, do something that they weren't doing anyway. So I was pretty good at that. Um, but then I saw this presentation and I said, this is the missing piece because this is the North Star. If you can make a business stronger and better, more resilient, more profitable over time by virtue of the fact that it's acting consistent with the way the world works best, that's a big idea. At the time in the United States, Nobody thought Nobody. that way, yeah. um, you know, and and so I was very lucky in that, you know, I had this idea. It became I kind of became quite obsessed by it. Um, and so I ended up taking a sabbatical from the company that I co-founded to see if there really was a business in it. And there was. And that was 20 years ago. And, you know, that's that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Just as an aside, my relationship with Chile started by running the Bio Bio River when it was an actual free running river uh, in the 80s and uh, as a commercial guide. And then I would kayak and do a lot of the different runs uh, along the uh, the uh, Andes there. And um and it was during that period that I came to know Doug Tompkins. And so I would, uh, for many years, I'd go down and do the commercial trips. And then I'd go see him at what was before Pumalin. And he just bought this ranch and we'd go do adventures. And he'd tell me about all his big ideas. So so uh, anyway, so, so I, I've been coming to Chile for a long, long time. And... Um, and love it. It's a beautiful, beautiful country and and uh, beautiful people. Well, so actually that invitation I was making at the very beginning with the mate and everything, maybe eventually it could be real face to face, not it online. Oh, it Wonderful. will be. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I still come down. Hopefully we'll we'll have that conversation eventually down here. Um, Doug, many questions that happens after the the short version that you've just tell me about what your life was or has mm -hmm. been. Yeah. Path. Um, at that early stage, when you realize that there was a commercial opportunity, that the tribe was important, how could you or, or what was your strategy to try to show, convince um make others get enthusiastic about the idea or the mm -hmm. um yeah the evolution between that romanticism of making things sustainable and taking care of the planet and and nature and the the organic way things go on and, and nature goes on into business and and even more um the sustainable impact on the environment and the society that that has Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I I realized pretty quickly that, particularly at the time, um, this was not something that you could bring to a middle level manager. So uh, companies in this country at the time, if they, if and how they were relating to the environment, and and if you will, social justice surrounding, uh, you know, the people both working in their companies and, and in their supply systems was usually in some sort of compliance division. 
So the whole idea was you needed to comply with the law. So the best companies in the United States, anyway, complied with the law. The law is a pretty low bar, particularly as it pertains to, you know, these these issues of of sustaining life on Earth for you know our children and their children's generation. So I realized pretty quickly, like. The, the people I would normally talk to are not even going to like have bandwidth and any mandate and any budget to, to do anything different. So it was really a CEO or a board level conversation, um, a strat, a strategic, it's a, like a macro strategy really. So uh, a friend of mine who ran a, uh, one of the largest, environmental nonprofits called Conservation International, who I actually just incidentally met in Chile many, many years before. Um, and he was a friend. And, and so I went to him because he had all these captains of industry on his board at the time who were obviously interested in conservation because they were on his board and giving him money. And But meanwhile, their businesses we're doing nothing more than complying with the law. And I was like, so I called him and, and I said, Peter, his name was Peter Seligman. And I said, I got this crazy idea and I just need five minutes with anybody, any of your board members to see if they're interested. So um, that was, he, he introduced me to uh, some, some business leaders and, and the, they liked the idea. The timing was good. They needed, they needed, uh, or wanted, they saw advantage to, to cutting out waste because the, the easy thing to do in this space for most big companies in particular is just cut out waste because mm -hmm. waste costs money. So, and I'll just give you an example. We were working with uh, a retailer, and they realized pretty quickly that they were paying for packaging, what's called secondary packaging. So it's the, the boxes come in boxes, mm -hmm. right? Which often come in boxes. And so by the time you're putting stuff on the shelf, you've just got the box of the product, but you've got all this old, you know, corrugate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they were basically, as they realized, paying for it in the first place then they were having to wrap it all up and then they were paying people to take it away. So, and it, to the tune of millions of dollars a year. So they realized, well, first of all, let's redesign the packaging so we don't need two or three levels of packaging in the first place. That'll cut off a lot of costs, which it did. And then they realized, oh my gosh, there's actual value in this so we can sell it not only not pay people to take it away, but we can sell it. So, so it was simple sort of things like that, that really got the momentum going it was like, wow, this is, this is good for the business and good for the environment. And the amazing thing is, is people back to the tribal side, people, you know, everybody has to work. But all things being equal, if I can work and make a living and do live my life and be part of a company that I feel is authentically working on things more than just making money for the shareholders, generally speaking, people like that. Mm -hmm. And so what they, you know, most companies have figured out that are deeply involved in this kind of work today is that it, it allows them to attract and retain talent in a time when it's quite difficult to attract and retain talent. Especially new talent, actually, because yeah. mainly yeah. new generations and millennials, yeah. so they need that purpose within their work. And yeah. then usually they leave pretty quick, right? Middle, yeah. um, uh, Middle East is the destination nowadays, and they all have to go at one point, and that's yeah. that's it with your company. Um, listening to you, it seems that it was pretty spotless. It was pretty easy. It was pretty logic for everybody to say, sure, I mean, I could save money, and I could 
uh, reduce in this case wage uh, waste or packaging. Mm-hmm. But I'm guessing over this 20 years, and even though in, in the website of the company, you still talk about these boxes and sustainability box is not the one that takes the lead. Mm-hmm. Why? If it's so logical, in this case, to you and me at least. Yeah. Well, it is logical. The The, the problem comes after you, uh, as they say, harvest the low hanging fruit. <laughs> so again, pretty quickly, you it, I think of it like a lens. So you bring a new set of glasses to look around your business and all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's money lying over there and there's money lying over there. And if I make an investment in LED lighting today, it will pay back in three years and then forevermore, I'll be you know saving on my electrical bill. What's not to like? So that stuff, is is pretty easy and pretty straightforward the next level and then the next level above that are quite complicated and and they're much riskier financially so they tend to people take them like well wait a minute let's do we really want to do this and in publicly traded companies there's even legal incentives disincentives to taking these kinds of risks because shareholders can look in and say, well, why are you spending a million dollars on that? Which is, has no clear payback to me because there's laws and in, in capitalism here in the United States that say, you know, you need to be serving your shareholders. So, so companies get very uh, nervous and, and much more risk adverse as the, projects get more complex and to really move towards regeneration and sustainability in society requires changing of vast systems so in agriculture we know how to grow everything in ways that that enhance, let's just say, the quality of the soils year over year. We don't do it because if I now have to compete against a big farm that is using fossil fuel inputs and denuding the topsoil and the quality of the soil, but is still getting big, big yields at low prices in the short term, and I'm spending money and getting lower yields and, and having higher prices in the short term, I can't sell my product. So, so that is where everything stands today. We're in this, this, this very big transformation, which will happen, by the way. It's just a matter of time because the earth bats last, as they say. The, the, the earth is in charge. The planet is in charge. Just, you know, we are stewards of this. And so it will tell us what we can and can't do over the long term. I see our our job is to encourage human beings, which are basically we have choice and we can do things to be in front of the demanded, the needed changes, because it's really in our interest, actually. Uh, and then long-term. following that same line of thinking, how do you foresee it? Because you're talking about this, let's put it in, into um, farms, but we can go furthermore and go into states, like in the mm-hmm. states with California and the rest of them, or countries mm-hmm. where we all live under the same umbrella, same mm-hmm. planet, right? right? But we're not all doing the same, different paced, still different logics, and it seems that even though the first part is pretty basic, not even that first part is taking care everywhere the same way, even taking care. End of the sentence. How do you yeah. perceive? Well, again, it, 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 the problem is our whole system is, is set up to incentivize things to be at their lowest costs all the way through the chain. And so the 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 word is what ends up happening is we externalize costs so that can be with people 
So there are still very, very bad labor practices happening all over the world associated with agriculture and fishing and various things because it's the cheapest way to do things. Even though it's illegal, you know, doesn't matter, it's cheap. And that means when I'm selling my products into the global marketplace, the commodity marketplace, I'm, I, I make more money and that's the game. So it's, it's just, even without illegal activities, let's just say for a moment, it's a perfect world and everybody is complying with the laws of the countries and on all levels, socially and environmentally, we're still externalizing costs to the environment, meaning we are putting carbon into the atmosphere at no cost, for example. So, so, and that builds up year over year over year and then creates big problems for everyone. So again, that's why I say there is an inevitability to the fact that we're going to figure this all out. We kind of have figured it all out from a science basis. The problem is the economic basis, the system of economics that, that human beings operate under just really is not set up to, to deal with these externalized costs very well yet. But again, it, it, it will come and it is coming and there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. It's just at the macro scale. And to be fair, you know, people need access to low cost food. We can't just have organic products at super high prices that, you know, people like you and I can afford to eat. And just say that's the way it's going to be because as we know there are a lot of people who every penny counts Absolutely. so how do you how do you do that i don't know is time then too i guess a ingredient in this all formulation that runs against us right i mean okay we scientifically get it economically not yet as you were saying but then mm -hmm we got to run because time is just running ahead of us and mm -hmm. we should figure it out before mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, and just because I don't want to take more time of yours, but I really wish this would be the lake and we would have the all afternoon because it's really, really interesting. Um, and knowing, as you said at the beginning of the conversation, um, one of the reasons coming to Chile too was because you had a great friend here, Douglas Tompkins, that enjoyed the south of Chile. That and that's when when we have a loss so close to us, we realize that any time is our time too. How would you like to be remembered? You have children. Um, you have. Uh, people that will talk about you, how would you like them to refer to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as a heartfelt person who um, worked hard with people, I mean, I, I like working with teams and that comes from the running rivers and expeditions you can't you can't do these things alone at all and you and it's fun to be part of a team of competent people who you trust and who trust you uh and so working with a team on these these matters of great importance and meaning um, to create more beauty in the world, really. I mean, that's kind of the way I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, who knows what the moral right thing to do is honestly, but the South of Chile, as an example, is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And, and it's beautiful by virtue of the fact that there's very little direct human intervention you know, God or whatever you want to call it has, has created this incredible place. 
and we get a chance if you're if we're lucky enough to to experience it and and so that to me is what's possible you know human beings can create such incredible beauty um with with our systems with our economies with our businesses in our lives and so that's that's how i i hope hope to be remembered wonderful Jib, thank you so much for this conversation. Again, um, hopefully when you get the chance to come down here, you'll let us know and we could have uh, this con conversation outdoors or some... some well, we'll, we'll, we'll have some Cheers, Cheers. for that. <laughs> Jib, yeah. thank you so much again. You're welcome. Escuchaste conversaciones que inspiran y nos invitan a tomar acción en el cuidado de nuestro planeta. Esto fue Sustentablemente, junto a Carolina Escobar, un podcast original de Radio Pauta.